I'm your hot water heater. You hardly know I exist. That's too bad. Because if my pressure relief valve gets stuck... We hot water heaters can transform into rocket-propelled wrecking balls. And if you got the wrong home insurance coverage, it's your bank account that might explode. So get all state. Well, good morning. <laughs> and welcome to Mayhem. Mm -hmm. We are glad that you're all here. And realizing that, guys, mayhem can happen and will happen anywhere and at any time. Right, today we're starting this whole brand new series. We're going to be in it for um, the, this, uh, this whole uh, month. And, you know, just walking into a room where all the chairs are messed up can just sort of be interesting and fun because we can just move the chairs back uh, next week. But we realize today's a pretty serious topic. Mayhem is not fun. It's not easy. And actually today is probably one of the most difficult and perplexing questions that you will deal with. Why is there mayhem? Why is there suffering evil? Why do bad things happen to good people? And if you're not grounded here, guys, this can rock your world. I remember I went to my 20th high school reunion a number of years ago. And um, I'm talking to this woman, I'll call her Mary, um, and we're, I have not seen this woman in 20 years, um, and she's married, and we're talking about work and all this other stuff, and then she asked me, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a pastor, and her face just went cold. It's interesting, the responses you get when you tell people that you're a pastor. And I said, is everything okay? And she said... Actually, no. It was very sharp. She said, a number of years ago, my first child died hours after childbirth. And I want absolutely nothing to do with a God who would murder my innocent baby or anybody who represents him. And she turned and walked away. She was angry, she was bitter, and this had been years before. She's looking and going, you know, my baby didn't do anything. Why would this happen? Now, maybe for some of you this morning, the whole issue of why do bad things happen to good people is just a perplexing question. But for some of you here, this is, an, this is a question that eats at you. It rocks you, like my friend Mary. There are a lot of people, and I've talked to a number, who the number one stumbling block for them becoming a follower of the God of the Bible is the fact that they're suffering in evil and bad things happen to good people. And all you got to do is open your eyes and you see it all over the place all the time. I mean, just, recently, just last Sunday you had... Uh, the terrorists that went in uh, to Pakistan to a bunch of folks having a just a a picnic and they they killed seventy plus people, most of them women and children, just and targeted Christians. There's the bombing in Brussels. Over and over again, we see the ravages of sin and suffering and evil, and you go, God, why? It's it doesn't seem fair. Guess what, guys? It's not. Life is not fair. Parents, one of the most important lessons you can teach your kids, life isn't fair. Some people are born to multimillionaires. Some people are born to peasants or, or starving beggars in India or Indonesia or Africa. So, Today, I want you to listen carefully. If you never take notes in a message, I encourage you to take them today because you're going to run into somebody three, four weeks, six weeks, two months down the road who are asking this question, why did this happen to me? Why did, the, why did God let this happen? And you need to be grounded. But more than that, you're going to face this at some time. 
And you're going to be the ask, the, asking this question, why God? And the way you answer it and the way you handle it will greatly determine your relationship with God. You see, pain and, and trials and difficulties can either drive you away from God, like it did my friend Mary, or it can drive you to God, your source of comfort and strength. So you need to have some anchors down on this whole issue and topic. So, but today I want to focus not on generally, but on you. Why do bad things happen to you? And what we're going to talk about this morning is that there's two basic options of why bad things have happened. And then we're going to talk about three truths about God that you need to know when mayhem hits. So you got that? Two reasons, three truths about God. So let's dig in. If you have your Bibles, um, you can turn with me to John chapter 16, verse 33, or you can look at it up on the screen. And Jesus said this, I have told you these things. And by the way, I didn't put the whole passage in front of it, but what he's talking about, he said, guess what? Bad things are going to happen. You're going to be persecuted. People are going to come after you. Some are going to seek to kill you, think they're doing God a favor. So a lot of bad things are coming. He goes, so I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Now I want you to think about it. I don't know about you, but when I have somebody tell me some really bad things are going to happen, I don't normally feel a lot of peace. <laughs> I feel just the opposite. But Jesus said, I'm warning you. I'm letting you know this is going to happen so that in the midst of it, you can have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, guys, here's my goal for you this morning. I want you to be able to experience and know a deeper level of peace in your life when mayhem hits. When things don't go well at all. I want you to be able to experience this peace. I want you to have some answers and no truth. Because again, what you believe about this makes a huge difference. So, the first option is this. Maybe you are the victim of a broken world. Maybe you're the victim of a broken world. Now, this morning, I, I don't know for sure, I don't know exactly what everybody here, what you believe about God or creation or Adam and Eve, but whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian or spiritual or not spiritual, I think every one of us in here would agree we live in a broken world. Amen? All right. We live in a really broken world. There's a lot of messed up stuff, and people are the blame for a lot of it. Now, the world is broken because of sin. The Bible tells us that sin is anything that falls short of God's perfection and God's glory. And there are evil people in this world, like the terrorists who are blowing people up and everything else. And you look around at, at a lot of what's going on around the world and you see ego and pride and hatred and selfishness and and mean spirits, and it's causing an enormous amount of pain and suffering. But God's sin goes beyond just what we do. The Bible teaches us that sin entered the world with the first humans, Adam and Eve. Now, I know that for some people can sound like a fairy tale and whatever else, but Jesus talked about Adam and Eve as real people, and since Jesus talked about it, and I believe in Jesus, I'm going to go with the guy who rose from the dead. I believe Adam and Eve were real people. And the Bible says that when the first humans, God gave them the choice to obey God or not, to love him or not, and they chose sin. They chose to go their own way. And it's like, what were you thinking? And then we look at our lives and we go, oh yeah, well I know what you're thinking. You're thinking the same thing I'm thinking. We think we know better than God. We think he's holding out on us. We know how to really experience life and fulfillment and everything else. So we're going to do it our way. 
And when they chose to sin, sin entered the world. And the Bible says that it entered even all of creation. All of creation is groaning, is suffering. So there's a lot of things of tornadoes and hurricanes and, and, and random things breaking. Because we live in a sin-filled, sin-impacted, broken world. So, all of creation is impacted to this. And maybe the reason you have experienced something bad happening is that you are simply a victim. And I don't even like the term victim. Because there's a victim mentality around. But you're a victim of a, of a broken world. You know, I've gone through a lot in my life where I didn't have anything to do with what happened bad. When I was three years old, um, I was riding in the car with my grandfather and my grandmother. And this, by the way, guys, some of y'all don't even realize this. In the dark ages, they let kids ride in the front seat. They didn't know any better. Some of y'all actually may remember that. They didn't even have seat belts. My grandfather is coming up over an overpass and he has a heart attack. He slumps over the wheel and the car goes off an embankment and starts to roll. My grandmother wraps her body around mine as we're banging around in there and she dies in the accident. My grandfather dies six months later from a broken heart because he always said, I killed my wife and from the complications. And I ended up in a body cast for six months and I still have a 12-inch scar across my back where I was almost cut in two. Now, I was sleeping at the time. I was a sleeping three-year-old. What did I do to cause that? Nothing. I was a victim of a broken world where there are things like heart attacks. And car accidents. Guys, you have been a victim of this broken world. And there are so many people with false ideas about this. In fact, the entire book of Job deals with this issue in question. Bad things start happening to Job like crazy, and he's got three friends, and with friends like that, who needs enemies, who keep telling him over and over and over, it, it, it's got to be you. If bad things are happening, it's because you've sinned or somebody else, it's probably you. And some of you are going through stuff right now, and you're going, what did I do wrong? What, why did, how did I miss this? What, why is God punishing me? I must have sinned, or somebody else must have sinned, et cetera, et cetera. And the whole book says, guess what? No, Job was a righteous man. We live in a sinful, broken world, and we have an enemy, and his name is Satan. And he's real, and he's alive, and he wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. And you may be a victim of a broken world. Now, by the way, in the midst of all that, and we'll get to it, God still has a plan. God can still redeem it. But I want you to get over this. Everything that happens, it must be because of something you did at some point in your life. Or God just must not care. Or it was just fate. If you want to blame someone or something, you can blame this sin-filled, broken world. And I'm not immune from it, and you're not either. Jesus tells us, in this world, you will have trouble. Maybe you're the victim of a broken world. Or there might be another reason. Number two, maybe you brought it on yourself. (laughs) Maybe you brought it on yourself. You know, now we don't like to hear about this one. But you see, the problem with sin is that it's not just out there, it is also in here. In the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul wrote this to them. And he said in Galatians 6, 7 uh, 7 and 8, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. By the way, there are a lot of people who mock God. They say, well, I'll go to church and I'll, I'll go to confession or I'll tell God I'm so sorry. And then I'll turn around and just keep living the same old way. Uh, God's not fooled. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal 
life. Now, Jesus is using a farming analogy because he's speaking to an agrarian society. They all understood farming, and even though most of you have never farmed a day in your life, you can understand this analogy. When you plant wheat, you don't expect soybeans to come up. Some of you are planting tomato bushes. You don't expect to go out and see bananas one day. And Jesus is saying, what you sow, what you plant, is what you're going to reap. And the same is true of the flesh. And the flesh refers to that sinful or messed up or foolish, selfish part of us that when God says go this way, we go, no, I think I want to go that way. That's the flesh. And all of us will battle the flesh. So we've got to be honest. And we've got to say, a lot of times the problems we're in facing is because we bring it on ourselves. In fact, we could just have a whole testimony time right now. Because everyone in here, you know of some decisions you've made that have messed you up some. And, and you brought it on yourself. When I was a teenager, I was, um, I, I loved, well, I still do, anything with adventure and excitement and everything else. And I really got into uh, a lot of outdoor uh, kind of sports and hiking and backpacking and spelunking and, and rock climbing. I loved rock climbing, um, and I said there's a special thrill about being on a, like a, a one-inch ledge 200 feet above the ground. Um, it also built my ego because I was really good at it. Um, and that always, you know, you always tend to like what you're good at. And, you, and a side note of that, it helped, is I was 6'3 and weighed 135 pounds. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was a long reach and not a lot to have to uh, hold up. But I got cocky and arrogant. Never happens to any of you, I know. But I'm walking with a friend where I get, and we see a little 40-foot cliff, which we thought was nothing. And he goes, I bet I can beat you up there. And I said, not a chance. And we both picked our roots. I got up 20 feet up there, and I grabbed at a place that came loose in my hand, and I back dove down 20 feet and landed on my head and messed my neck up for the rest of my life. In fact, I almost died. And I could go, oh God, why did this terrible thing happen to me? Because I was an idiot. <laughs> and I went rock climbing with no helmet, no ropes, no carabiners, none of the equipment that I knew how to use. I was dumb. You see, Nothing like that has ever happened to my wife, Deb, because she would never think of going rock climbing without all the proper equipment. Of course, if you know Deb, she wouldn't go rock climbing with all the equipment in the world. <laughs> so sometimes we bring things on ourselves. Some of you have dated somebody. And you look back and going, oh, what was I thinking? You were an idiot. <laughs> and you have brought it on yourself. Sometimes we go, oh, God, why did I get this speeding ticket? Well, let's think about this. So why do bad things happen to good people? Sometimes you're a victim of a broken world. And sometimes... <laughs> You bring it on yourself. And, and here's something is an important concept here I don't want you to miss. Jesus, again, is using this analogy. You sow to the flesh, you're going to reap it. And all. A lot of times when you plant and sow something, you don't reap it the next day. And that is a trick of the enemy. For example, well, you sow, but then you reap it later. So let's say you go to a party and you drink a little too much, but you drive home real carefully, you get home, no big deal. You think, I got away with it. It's not a problem. And then two weeks later, it happens again and you get home, fine. You're reaping something, but not yet. And then three months later, when you think you've got this all under control, you get pulled over after a party and you get a DWI or DUI, depending on who you're talking to. 
and all of a sudden you're paying out tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees, you've lost your job, you could have wrecked your car, worse, you could have killed an innocent person, and all of a sudden you're going, oh, why is all this happening to me? You're reaping what you sowed, but it came later. And a lot of times the enemy is smart enough not to bring the consequences early, but later. That's why you've got to learn truth. And God's saying, I'm going to tell you how to live. I'm going to tell you the right way. You've got to trust me. So sometimes you're the victim of a broken world. Sometimes you bring it on yourself. But either way, look what Jesus says in John 16, again. Let me read it to you. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Again, I want you to have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. You're going to be a victim of a broken world. There's going to be consequences and reaping of your own sowing of the flesh and of sin. But take heart. because I've overcome the world. That's what we talked about last week. Christ died on the cross and rose again to pay the penalty for our sin. And he has overcome the world. You see, Jesus is the answer both for the broken world and the broken me. And so that's why bad things happen. And here's the bottom line. If you don't see anything else, notice this on your outline there. We live in a broken world. Okay? But in Christ, we can have peace. We live, you live. In a broken world. But in Christ, you can experience and have peace. And that is my prayer for you this morning. And we're going to have a time where we're going to open up the altar. Where you can come and pray and, and really allow God to give you a supernatural peace. But I, I want to conclude today with a passage from the book of Hebrews. Three verses that have three truths that God says you need to know when you're dealing with this. So in Proverbs... Chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, it says this, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Realize that every one of us, Christian, non-Christian, everything else, one day you will stand before a holy God and you will give an account for how you've lived and you'll give an account for what you've done with Jesus Christ. But the first truth is there, he goes, it's all, nothing is hidden from his sight. The first truth is this, God knows. God knows. He knows everything you're going through. He knows what's happened. He knows the effect of a broken, sinful world. He knows the doubts and the fears. He knows about your sin and poor decisions. Guys, he knows about mayhem. Nothing is catching God off guard. He's not going, oh, whoa! You didn't know the chairs were all messed up today, but God does. And you don't know all that's going on and it's going to be coming, but God does. God knows. Nothing is hidden from him, but the writer continues. Therefore, because God knows, since we have a great high priest <clears throat> who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess when these things hit and happen don't go away from God hold firmly to him because he's the only one that's conquered the world verse 13 for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet he did not sin God knows, but number two, God cares. God cares. He knows what's going on, but he's not far off and, and distant. He's saying, I'm the high priest. Now, the writer of Hebrews is writing to the Jews of that day. They understood who the high priest was. The high priest was the priest who was able one time a year to go into the holies of holies and make a sacrifice for the sins of the entire nation. Jesus, God himself, became our high priest. But he's been tempted. And by the way, he suffered as an innocent victim of this broken, sin-filled world. 
That's what drove him to the cross. He knows and he cares. As it says, he can empathize with our weaknesses because he understands. He cares. And he has overcome the world. And he is far bigger and far greater guys, than any brokenness here. He suffered. He was tempted. And yet without sin. So God knows. And God cares. He's not sitting up in heaven with his hands folded going, <laughs> reap what you sow, rascal. You, know, you made a dumb decision. It's just, no, it tears him up. And he knows. We live in a broken world. But in Christ, we can have peace. So God knows, God cares, but the writer of Hebrews goes one more. Verse 16. Let us then, because God knows and God cares, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The third truth, God is with you. God is with you. God is with us. And God invites us to his throne of grace in our time of need. The very thing that so many people do, like my friend Mary, is in anger and hurt and pain, turn away from the very one who loves her and wants to help her and encourage her and take her through it. God knows. God cares. God is with you. And he wants you to come boldly before his throne of grace. It's like, it's not only that Jesus is our high priest who goes in for us, he puts his arm around our shoulder and says, come on in with me. You can go into the Holy of Holies and talk to the God of the universe. Now, if you really think through this, I know some of you have thought and said, well, you know, why, God, why doesn't God just fix this whole broken world? Why doesn't he fix my sin and brokenness? And why doesn't he fix sin and brokenness of the whole world? Guys, he took care of the issue of your sin and brokenness when he died on the cross. And he took the penalty, the full penalty of sin. And he rose again as the first fruits. So you can experience grace and mercy and forgiveness for every dumb, stupid thing you have ever done. There's still consequences. I still have a messed up neck. But I've been forgiven and experienced his grace. Your sin can be forgiven now. And guess what, guys? One day soon, God says, in fact, the whole plan of the, the Bible, the redemption is one day I'm going to handle all this sin and suffering. And Jesus is going to come. He's going to split the sky in two. And time as we know it will be done. And all sin and suffering and pain will be done away with. And we can experience him personally, physically, for all of eternity. So he is going to fix this broken world. And in between now and then, God says in Romans 8, 28, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. He will even use your mistakes, your mess-ups, your sin and the effects of this broken world, all the mayhem that happens to you, it is not good. It doesn't say it's good. He says he will use it for good. So how many of you today are facing some mayhem in your life? Facing some real struggles. And you have a choice. You can either turn away from God in anger, like my high school friend Mary did, or you can turn to him. And know that God loves you, God knows, He cares, and He's with you. And you can come and receive His grace and His mercy to help you. So as we kind of begin this whole series on mayhem, I, I want to invite you, if you like, when we sing this next song, which is an incredible song, we're going to be singing, Good, Good Father. Because whatever you're going through, 
whatever you face, he is still a good, good father. Several weeks ago, I went to the funeral of one of my lifelong best friends. He battled devastating cancer for three years. We saw him waste away in front of us. And in video, he was able to proclaim. He goes, he goes, if you're watching this, this means I'm not here. But I want you to know, God's got this. And he and his wife chose the song, Good, Good Father, for his funeral. He was a victor of a broken, sin-filled world. But today, you can experience a supernatural peace because not everything's going great, not that you're not going to suffer and deal with things, but because Jesus has overcome the world. So I invite you to trust me today. Take all the pain, all the hurt, all the stuff. Say, God, I can't handle all this. I give it to you. I trust that you know, that you care, and that you're with me. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we do live in this broken world. But Lord, I know that in you we can have peace. You've promised it. And I want to pray for people here this morning, right now, who are going through incredible mayhem. And I don't even know what it is. It may be so hard and so deep and so personal. They haven't told anybody. There's a major crisis of, of finances in their life. Or they've got news from a doctor. Or there's some event that's happened in the past like my friend Mary, with the death of her child. There's somebody here, and you were molested as a child, and you've got, God, why, why would you let that happen to me? <coughs> and you're a victim of a broken, sin-filled world. And I'm so sorry that that happened. But you can come today and put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ who has overcome the world. He said, you can experience my grace and my mercy and my peace. And the Apostle Paul says, it's a peace that transcends and is beyond all understanding and all comprehension. Is in a moment we're going to stand and we're going to sing, good, good father. And if you don't even know the words yet, it's easy to sing. Start Start trying to say those words and proclaim that truth. Maybe some of you who want to come and just kneel at the altar and just say, God, I'm giving this all to you. I can't handle this kind of pain, this kind of stuff. I, I, I've been carrying it too long. I'm going to lay it at your feet. And if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Christ and really trusted him, and you're at a crossroads of whether you're going to go your own way and continue that way or you're going to trust him and admit that you have sinned and believe in Christ that he came and lived and died on a cross and that now you're going to be willing to confess him as Lord and Savior let this be that day because he's overcome the world and he wants to overcome it for you and in you so that you experience his peace thank you Father in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? And let's sing in worship. Good, good Father, the altar is open. I'm here at the front if anybody wants to pray. Just do business with God. Some of you are still angry. You're upset about something in the past. Give it to Him right now. Say, God, I can't carry this anymore. This is yours.